Today is a Ghost Girl Diaries podcast. This is a podcast for those of you that are brave enough to join the circle. Today is um, probably going to be one, probably the last. I mean, I really don't have anything else to add. Uh, completing my series I've done the last few years of a lifestyle podcast. I went back and forth on if I should even do this. And the main reason was, is like, so many of you are messaging me on all my social media platforms. Crystal, I get back to Ghost Girl, we get back to, to Paranormal. And I know, I agree, but I had to be in the correct, you know, mental state to do that. And we'll talk about some of that stuff here. But I really thought I owed it to, to those of you that have been following me not only for a long time but through this healing journey I really felt like I owed you a final podcast and this is that podcast and I hope maybe not today but maybe someday there will be somebody out there that goes through a dark night of the soul that goes through having a loved one murdered and they need my podcast and someday even if it's one person they can go back and watch you know the last two years of my podcast from like 2022 to 2024 and they will be able to find a light in the dark and that's me helping guide them through the dark night of the soul. A couple of days ago, I was thinking about this podcast as I'm gearing up to, to throw myself, yeet myself back into paranormal. I'm like, okay, should I skip this podcast? Should I do this podcast? And then all of a sudden I got embarrassed. I got embarrassed of all of the podcasts I've done for the last two years which is very normal for like human emotion, right? For me as a individual looking back, you're my collective, right? And it started out as a paranormal collective, it morphed into a makeup collective and then it morphed into this like spiritual community of me sharing this like horrible dark thing I went through and how I've been processing it, how, I, how I've been going and how I finally come out to the other side. And I was like, no, 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 you can't be embarrassed because if I even help one person, even if it's one person in a million, if I can help them find the light in the dark through what I've been through, then it was worth sharing my story. Don't be embarrassed, you know? No, not everyone lives their life publicly like I do, but since I have chose to share my dark night of the soul as a divine feminine, if there's anyone that can find some sort of light from what I've shared, then I've done my job, and it was worth it. I had someone on TikTok say, oh, Crystal, like, you look really different. You're, it's not just like, but this is a wig, by the way. I'm going to be doing a video where I, I recreated this wig for a Megan Fox look. And I, I'm just wearing it today because I had some, like, footage to do for TikTok. But, so my hair's still blonde. Um, but I had somebody on TikTok that was like, your, your energy's just very different, Crystal. Like, I can tell you've come out of this darkness. And someone called it. A purgatory that I'd been in, I, a self-purgatory. I don't think they meant it personally, this person on TikTok. However, I get mixed reviews. Some people say, oh my god, it took you two years to go through your mom's murder. Some people say, is that long enough? You know, I get mixed reviews on back and forth. I have other really close friends that say, there's no timeline. You've just got to heal, you know? like And clearly when my mother was killed, did I think it was going to take two years to get out of it? Absolutely not. I didn't know. I honestly, in the beginning, thought I was never going to make it out. I thought I was going to be in the darkness forever. And, um, but when someone says something like that to you and says, oh, like, you know, oh, you're finally out of purgatory, that comment really, like, to put it vaguely, it pissed me off. And it pissed me off because... Unless you have had someone close to you where their life was intentionally taken 
you have no clue what that feels like and i'm gonna be real i don't want you to know what that feels like i don't want anyone to ever experience the horrible darkness that i encountered i don't want everyone anyone on this planet to ever experience i hate the word demons and demonic you know like on my side of paranormal i've always said like oh god like you know one way to make me roll my eyes till I see my brain is talking about, oh, it's a demon, it's demonic. But if I can ever promise you that I've encountered anything, it was the person that killed my mom. And she was demonic. And that hospital in Summerlin is demonic. I'm dead serious. I've never experienced some something so dark in my life, energy so dark. I, I spent $100,000 trying to sue the hospital for her death and couldn't because they're protected. And I truly, to this day, believe my mother was killed by a serial killer. I truly believe that. I believe this woman killed my mom. I believe there's a ring of nurses up there killing patients for pain medication. I think that they prey on the elderly because they think they're weak and they won't be missed anyways. And I think there's a serial killer on the loose in Vegas. And I'm not kidding you when I say that. She is still she was not reprimanded. She wasn't fired. She's still working as a nurse actively at Summerlin. And um, I would never wish that pain and embarkment and dark journey on anyone to ever experience. And you know, it was so much more than that that people don't realize at that time. It was like a perfect storm for me. At the time, I had just sold my beautiful house. I had this mini mansion in an area called Southern Highlands. It was beautiful. I was divorcing from my husband at the same time. So I was going through a divorce, a separation, separating, you know, property and assets. I had to split finances on the house. Then which is just sad anyway. You know what I mean? Like divorce, finalize, like breakup, and that's not fun. Thank God there weren't kids involved. That's an ugly situation. So then I'm losing my house. I'm having to move at the same time. My mother's in the hospital, she's sick. She's literally being killed off. She's now on life support. Then my dad can't handle the stress and he turns around and has a heart attack and dies. And not a single family member reaches out to me to, you know, make sure that I'm okay. I was in a very dark, dark place for a very long time. And I really didn't realize that there were some people in my life, I think, that didn't believe I was going to come out of it. And I think that they believed I'm resilient like that's just a side note I've been through a lot in my life and it's weird because I don't think about it like that like I think of back on my life as chapters you know what I mean like if I'm looking at like growing up and dealing with my family who dealt with drug and alcohol abuse like I don't feel like that defines me because that's not who I am that's not my projection of the world but I feel like it's a chapter I see it as a very past version of myself same with like high school that's a different separate chapter you know I just look at parts of my life like a chapter but I'm resilient I've been through a lot and people in my life were doubting that I was ever going to come out of this darkness and that hurt and um, so I want to talk about that today this sort of final step if you will of becoming the Phoenix rising coming out of the ashes completely starting in December and losing a few more people in my life that I thought would always be there. I have some notes on my phone because I don't want to forget anything. Denver. I started considering going back to Denver for a visit in December of last year, so December of 2023. I don't know what was causing it. I have this like soul tribe, soul family that has been in my life since I was three or five. People like shout out Nikki, Hassan, Mari, you guys know who you are. It's people, Cody, like I have this group of friends when my mother died. There are people that like you don't have to talk to every day, but they're always there. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I've known these people since I was three and five years old and it is like soul family, absolute soul family. They were texting me, calling me, checking on me, and I was reminiscing in December about going home to Denver. Now take in mind, 
half of these people aren't even in Denver. So it really wasn't them, it was just nostalgic, right? So December started coming back around and I decided, well, I was worried. December is a hard month. It's my mom's birthday and she was a Sagittarius. She had a lot of energy and growing up celebrating her birthday was the entire month of December. Christmas was a huge deal. December is a big month for my family usually. And so I was coming into December very concerned that I was going to be in another state of depression. And I don't know what happened, but the time, by the time December 1st rolled around, I woke up and said, we're not doing this again. And I really had this moment of realizing that I had really merged with my higher self. I told you guys I've had these major, major spiritual awakenings coming in from the other side, right? And it was almost like when December 1st hit, I knew intuitively I had to now merge all of these experiences and this new found mediumship, psychic abilities, whatever you want to call it. Whatever I, I have now been experiencing in the 5D, it now has to be merging with the 3D. And I just felt this like higher sense of self be like, okay, we've healed. We've allowed you to rest. We've allowed you to rejuvenate. It is now time to awaken again. So I went into December extremely positive. It was like night and day. Nothing really per se triggered it or happened other than me connecting with my higher self. And I was kind of happy because I, I was also worried that by the time my mom's birthday rolled around, I was gonna be upset and it did not happen that way. So as December was coming in, I was like, okay, you know, I'm kind of leaving this slight only goth image that I've been doing for the last few years. I don't want to just be goth, I want to be alt, and I want to be grunge, and I want to be feminine, and I want to be a divine feminine, I want to be in my light feminine. I don't want a title, I just want to be myself. You know what I mean? Before I was just identifying as goth girl, goth girl, goth girl. Like, no, no, we, I'm so much more than that, you know? Today I feel very punk, right? Like, and I, before I was just always goth, and I was like, no, no, no we, I, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be whatever I feel like waking up that day, I just want to be myself. And so I started saying, it's time to work on my feminine energy. And there was a couple of videos that popped up on my FYP from a content creator YouTuber called Shira7. I'm not going to say I agree with everything that she says. She does practice witchcraft though. Um, she also practices women or teaches women how to balance their dark feminine energy and light feminine energy and that was exactly what I was seeking and understanding like women need to know what they're worth once again take everything and mentors with a grain of salt right like you don't have to believe everything that they say just use them as a teaching tool right use them as what Bashar says is as a permission slip okay and I was starting to feel really good I was kind of starting like I I was in my I was just fully reborn. I don't really know how else to say it. And this was December. I started practicing femininity and I know I did a couple of little videos about that. I kind of went silent off of social media really into February. February I kind of just totally disappeared. And part of that reason was my dad and my mother's estate was settling and you know, I want to give you a little little key, just a little sprinkle that I want to throw in there. In December, this information came from my higher mind, okay? So it's, this was nothing I Googled or anything. I had a dream where my higher self said, for 30 days, literally get a calendar and mark it down. Every time a negative thought pattern, negative belief, so if you're talking to yourself negative, if you're saying something negative about yourself, if you're not believing in yourself, every time a negative belief pops up in your head, immediately discharge that belief. It's almost like active shadow work. So in your head, like you say, like, oh, you know, I didn't do very good. I should have done better. You know, all those like little negative comments we have in our mind. So my, my higher self said every time that little voice starts to creep in, absolutely stop yourself and replace it with a positive one. And I was like, you know, what is that going to do? 
and my higher mind, my higher self was like, you are retraining your neurons. You're retraining your thought processes. Pretty soon you won't even have to think about it because you'll just stop the negative thought patterns. But for 30 days, plug into yourself. And every time you have a negative thought pattern, stop yourself in your tracks, reroute, and either dump the idea completely or replace it with a positive one. And in 30 days, let's see what happens and what changes. And I said, okay, all right. So by the time January 1st rolled around, my whole life had done a 180. It took about 30 to 60 days to really drop all of the negative thought patterns. I really don't do it anymore, to be honest. So now by the time February rolled around, my parents' estate cl was closing out. And now it was like, it really is like attracts like. It really is about you have to match your vibration to whatever it is you're seeking. This kind of goes into that thing that I've said where I really don't believe in manifestation. And I know that sounds crazy because I've been teaching you guys how to manifest. Manifestation is just what your highest timeline is. Whatever it is you're seeking, whatever dream it is that you want to do, an influencer, a paranormal investigator, that's not a manifestation. You're not manifesting it into your, into your life. That is what your highest timeline is. So if this is your highest timeline, you have to match your energy so that that energy can now flow on the same frequency, okay? That, that goes for if you want a car, if you want a house. If you don't believe you're worthy, or if you think, oh, how am I ever going to afford that $100,000 car? Then that is exactly what you're bringing in because your vibration is way lower and you're setting the car above you and you're down here with your vibration and it's never going to hit. You're going to constantly say, oh, I wish I could get that car and you're stuck in that energy. You'll always be wishing. So you have to replace that energy with that vibration so you're aligned. So, and it changed. It really flipped me upside down. So I got... um partial payment out for my father's estate in February, my mother's estate, and um, I was able to pay off debt. And that was sort of the last piece of the puzzle where, you know, I had spent a lot of money trying to sue for my mother's death and it didn't work. So by the time February rolled around, I was in a really, really high vibrational state, higher than even I had been previously to my mother's death. Mm -hmm. I had achieved a really high vibrational state from listening to my higher self by blocking out any negative thought patterns and negative beliefs. But what I didn't realize now, so what I've been practicing this negative thought patterns, releasing those December, and it's hard. I'm not going to lie to you. I personally had those little voices popping up like, oh, you're not good enough, you suck, you messed up, you screwed up. Every time you have a negative thought pattern, actively dump it in a trash can. And it is hard at first, but it will get easier, it will get better. So now that I've been practicing this for like December, January, February, man, it only took about 30 days, right? Now I'm getting not only the estate payments out, but other money is starting to just flow in flow and flow and I'm getting all these opportunities which is so weird because I was off social media I have all these companies saying we're gonna pay you to do this that I'm like uh, I'm sorry you know, I'm typing back I'm not gonna be able to do these you know active projects with you because you know I'm taking you know leave of absence currently I'll be back in a month or two we don't care we'll put you in contract just here's the money get to it when you get to it holy crap right so now I'm vibrating at such a high level I'm bringing things in and I don't even have to think in fact I was, I was, I'm still doing it, but I got to a point where when I was thinking to manifest something, I don't know, any th stupid little things, right? Okay, here's an example. One day I thought to myself, wow, now that I'm vibrating so high, I would love to invest in some, you know, exercise equipment. I'd really like to get like a foldable treadmill and like a foldable, you know, exercise bike for inside the house. The next day, I got an email from a company who already sent me a pink exercise, I'm sorry, a pink treadmill that's foldable. And I had to do a video for them. And it was free and they paid me to do the video. So I was getting my thoughts, my thoughts were becoming things within one to two days. And it was just freaking me out because it was just happening over and over and over and over. Now, what people don't also talk about 
is the neg side, negative side when this happens, right? So I'm healing and I'm vibrating at this high level and everyone around me is noticing it. Now, my real soul tribe, which are these people I've known since I was childhood, they're like, oh, thank God, Crystal. She came out of it, she made it out, she's great. But then I had a couple other friends that were not welcoming the change. So when you're vibrating at such a high level and a high frequency, fake people will be exposed. And basically I got payouts for my father's estate and I had three friends. So it wasn't just one, it was multiple that became extremely angry with the fact that I was no longer in depression. At first I was kind of shocked about it because I was trying to give people the benefit of the doubt. I'm a Cancer rising. My mom was Cancer Moon. You know, she gave people way too many chances. I do the same. I do the same. So when this was happening in February, I was like, I'm hoping these people change. I'm hoping they get over it. And it wasn't getting better. It wasn't getting better. These people were now acting out on me in extreme ways that I thought they'd never turn on me. I thought that we were friends for life and I was really hurt. It really felt like I was reprocessing a death, although nothing could hurt as bad as losing my mom. So I really had to take some time to decide, you know, what my next step was. And then I started getting family coming out of the woodwork. Now, I kept my mom's phone on for a year after she died and not a single family member called that phone. I don't think it, I needed to reach out to them. I did tell one cousin who delivered the message to everyone else that she died, but no one called me to give their condolences. And my mom was in contact with them. Previous to that, I have not spoke to some of these people who are related to me in over 10 years. And that's because I chose to opt out of being a part of their life because of their substance abuse. And simultaneously, and I've heard of this happening, when you level up and your vibration gets really high, all of a sudden here come people out of the woodwork because they want a piece of the pie. I'm going to be honest, and I don't even think that my family or cousins knew about Ghost Girl Diaries. I don't think they knew about anything. I really made it so that none of them could find me because I am extremely embarrassed of the people that they are. And here they come in February. I haven't talked to them in 15 years or more. And they start leaving comments on my YouTube channel. I'm so proud of you. That's my cousin. She's healing. Doesn't she look great? And still, not once have I even gotten an email in my public email asking for condolences for my mom. And so now I'm like, okay, this is interesting. How am I going to deal with this? Am I really going to let these people back into my life? Because I know that there's probably still a substance abuse happening. There's probably a 98% chance of it happening. And so I had to go into hermit mode in February between having some really close friends turn their back on me out of jealousy due to my financial abundance because I was more than better financially. Um, but at what cost? I lost my parents. You know what I mean? Like I would exchange that money any day for my parents back, right? Um, so I was losing some friends and then I was having some really toxic family try to come back in my life and I was really shocked and scared because for the first time they'd found out about Ghost Girl Diaries. So I had to really make a stern decision on if I was going to open that door or not and I couldn't decide what to do. So I went into hermit mode and the first thing I decided to do before I was ready to reemerge was start studying dark psychology. And I know what you're going to say, you're like, oh, you know, why would you study dark psychology? Well, I, I've always been easily manipulated. 
And I wanted to study dark psychology, not to manipulate others, but to be able to recognize signs of when I am being manipulated. I, uh, I'm a Cancer rising, right? And that sign is often associated with manipulating, right? Like cancers are known for being manipulators. I'm actually quite the opposite. I'm the one that's easily manipulated and it's because I'm a nice person. I give, you know, I give an inch, you take a mile. I'm just, that my mom was the same. And you know, I thought to myself, like, I don't really want to change myself. I still want to be that giving, you know, empathic person, empathy, empathetic. Um, but how do I do it with boundaries is kind of where I was at. And so I started studying dark psychology. My niceness often gets taken for weakness or it gets taken for granted. And I started to learn through these dark psychology books that I was reading is that when you allow a person, whatever you tolerate is what you're teaching people, you will tolerate right so if you have a spouse who is cheating over and over and over and over again and you're not leaving them they know you're never gonna leave and that they can do whatever they want they can be promiscuous right if you have a friend who is treating you like garbage and you continue to tolerate it and not instill boundaries they will just continue to treat you like garbage because they know how far that they can push you and so I really just wanted to do this research and make sure that I was prepared for these friends and family that I was having some major complications with. I knew I needed to change and it needed to change immediately, but I didn't know. I didn't know how. So I knew this was sort of my final phase of, before I was ready to come out of my little cocoon. You know, I've never shared this before. Um, this is something like I really didn't plan on ever sharing because it was just always kind of like a private thing within my family. But my father was extremely autistic and um, he was a genius, by the way. He had several businesses and he could run businesses like no other. But when it came to social skills and inner communication, like, you know, private communication with others and having one-on-one -on -one conversations, he struggled really badly. He couldn't look people in the eye if there were strangers in public. Um, he couldn't look them in the eye, he couldn't have a conversation, he just would shut down. And most of his businesses were ran off of, um, you know, company partnerships that had been long-term running. So he knew these people so he could go back to them over and over again. He wasn't one to bring in like new clients because of you know, his autism. And he came from a time with autism where it wasn't really a thing, it hadn't been really diagnosed, and no one really knew how to cope with it, right? And my dad was really on the spectrum of having struggled with social skills. And on top of that, he was, you know, I've talked about this before, my dad was really abused by his father in particular um, because he was different, because he was autistic. And so my mom saw my dad's struggle in the world of autism, right? And when I was a kid, I started showing signs of autism. And so my mom had me tested and I tested on the gifted and talented spectrum, particularly with numbers. My parents thought I was gonna grow up to be like, you know, a mathematician or a teacher or a doctor or um, an architect because I had an obsession with numbers and, um, I was just, I knew the answer to things before anyone else did. Like if the teacher would call on me, I knew it. Like I didn't even have to look at the paper. And so my school wanted to put me in what was called the CHIPS program, which is the talented and gifted program when I was a kid. Um, I also had a photographic memory, once again, particularly with numbers. And um, my mom did not want me to ever grow up thinking I was better than anyone or different than anyone. So she pretty much refused to put me in talented and gifted. And um, she was hell-bent and determined to make sure that I 
she used to say, you know, this like kind of famous thing, like where I feel like I can hear her repeating it right now, which is, you know, if people find out you're autistic, the world doesn't care. The world does not care if you're autistic. The world wants you to be normal. So you're going to have to like forcefully be as normal as possible. Now, once, once again, I am high functioning. I can look people in the eye. I can have conversations with people, but that wasn't always the case. Like when I was younger, I was scared to death. Like I can remember being in elementary school and I was the quiet, nerdy kid, right? Made straight A's, made because obviously I was, you know, supposed to be in talented and gifted. So oftentimes my teachers would call on me because they knew that I knew the answer. And I would be sweating bullets profusely. I would, I, I didn't want to speak in front of the class. I didn't want to talk in front of other people. Our teachers would make, uh, they would call on us randomly to read, you know, articles in front of the class. Oh my God, pouring sweat, stressed. I didn't want to talk in front of anybody. I was so scared to death to do it. So the way my mom dealt with that was I'm putting you in a public speech class. So she kind of forced me to be uncomfortable with whatever it was, you know, my little autistic brain couldn't handle because she was like, when you get older, the world's not going to bow to your autism. And I know that that could be a controversial topic. And I'm going to be honest, I don't want to, please don't give my mom a bad rap because I think the way she raised me was perfect. I think she did an amazing job. I think that everything I struggled with, she made me defeat head on. I was an extremely organized child and if chaos happened and I got too many toys out, I would scream and cry and I'd bang on the floor and she'd be like, okay, well, how do we resolve it? She taught me how to problem solve with my autism. She'd be like, okay, well, next time, don't get 12 toys out and you won't get stressed. So she taught me get one thing out, put it back, get one thing out, put it back. So she really was good with the way she taught me. She worked with me rather than against me and she wanted to meet me to be successful in life. But my point of this little tangent is being on the spectrum with autism, I think that I often will ignore red flags that most people would probably see immediately. And it's a, something I've struggled with my whole life is that a normal person would be like, woo, that's not good, that's a problem. And then I'm sitting here like, oh, it's okay, they're nice, like give them another chance. Like I just see the best in people to the point where I'm ignoring red flags. And I think that I was like, I need to go in this next phase of my life not doing that. And I've got to do whatever I can, weaponizing myself and preparing myself with tools in my tool belt so that I do see these red flags so that I don't end up being the one hurt in the end. So that was part of this process of sort of studying. My mom used to say, your brain just works differently than other people. And I think that's probably what makes me such a good producer is my autism side because it's like such good memory. And when, I, when I'm in production and I'm like really vibrating high and ready to shoot a series or whatever, like I get these drop down menus in my head and it's like priorities. I know exactly what needs to get done one thing at a time. And so I'm really happy that, um, I think autism is a superpower. I think it's a superpower. And I think that, you know, the world does see it differently sometimes, although I am high functioning, but I think it's a superpower if you're using it correctly. I think that um, it's a beautiful thing. I don't think it's a negative thing. So I started studying this year seven content and then I went into books from Napoleon Hill, Robert Greene. Robert Greene is an author. He's done several books and podcasts. I would highly suggest like getting on Amazon and looking these books up. But Robert Greene just really fascinated me. And, um, you know, I initially started studying this so that my family kind of couldn't come in and harm me again. And this was when I really started it, it was really when I started researching the dark psychology that I realized that I had some people surrounding me that were using me and manipulating me and were opportunists. And I didn't see it before. And it scared me. And you start, you know, it, the little things with this dark psychology stuff is sort of what Robert Greene says. Robert Greene talks about frenemies. And he talks about people that envy you and they don't really want to
be your friend, but they want to be nosy and be in your life and they want to know what's going on because they want to be in the know because they sort of want to be you, which is also like a frenemy, right? And he would say just these really fascinating things of like the little things are what matter. You know, if, if a friend says they're going to do something and they're going to do it and they never do it and months go by, oh, I'm still going to send that package. I'm still going to ship you your Christmas present. I'm still going to do this. I'm still going to do that and they still haven't done that, they are showing that not only they are extremely unreliable, they're also showing that what they're doing is an extreme pattern. And they're also showing that you are not a priority in their life, period. You are not a priority in their life. And those little patterns are what you need to really look out for. When I started really paying attention, it started to make me stressed and I started realizing what was going on. And it happened at the same time I got this, you know, financial compensation in from my dad's estate and everybody got, well, these few friends got really mean and angry. And it was almost like, they had been so used to seeing me down for so long, they didn't want to see me climb back out. They didn't believe that I had the resilience to come back out on top. I think that they know I'm a very driven person. People know what I have accomplished with Ghost Girl Diaries. And I think they thought this was the end of me and they were hoping it was the end of me. And in that time, in that time frame, where I had been down and depressed and in a very dark purgatory for a few years, they were above me. And when I started to crawl back out, they were like, oh, no, 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 no. you got to stay below us. You can't come back out above me because the minute you hit the surface, you know, we know you'll be above the land. And it was like mourning the death of a few friends. It was shocking because I was not expecting this to happen with these people. They had seen me so dark for so long, they did not want to see me happy. You cannot outdo the master. And in their mind, they were the master, right? And that's scary because now you have snakes in the grass and now they've become frenemies. I learned a lot that when you, know, you have to pay attention and even Shira Seven talks about this. When someone insults you or puts you down, it says nothing about you. Even online, if you talk about hate and bullying, although I have extremely thick alligator skin from doing YouTube for this many years, like nothing phases me. My mother was murdered. There's nothing you can say to hurt me. Like I'm already dead inside. You know what I mean? It's an ongoing joke, but it's true. There's nothing anyone can ever do or say to hurt me worse than that serial killer up in Summerlin, right? But when someone gives you an insult and puts you down, it says nothing about you. It says everything about them. Anytime somebody puts you down, it is a complete reflection from within them. That is how they're feeling on the inside and now they're projecting. And that's a big difference between men and women in the world because if a man gets insulted, he's not an emotional being. He's like, whatever, and just rolls it off his back. If a woman gets insulted or haters online, they're just crushed, right? Oh my God, my feelings are so hurt. You know, even in personal relationships in life, which is what was happening to me in February. But you have to really stop and sort of pull yourself out of the situation and look at it externally and be like, wait a second, I didn't do anything to this person for them to be projecting onto me like this. This must be how they are feeling. They are trying to put me down so that I get below them again, so that they feel superior. And that's dark psychology. When someone insults you, it is a direct link into their subconscious. They're seeing they're putting their insecurities on a screen for you to see. So pay attention because people that are insulting you are not your people. They don't want you to know that that's their subconscious. So they're going to turn the table and do psychology and make you think that you are the problem, right? And that's what was happening in February with a few of these friends. I'm on this, you know, phone call. And you know, here's the thing, like I get it. People have bad days. People have bad days, they have bad weeks, they have bad months. But like I had a bad two years. My mom was killed and I wasn't out projecting on people. You know what I'm saying? Like I wasn't going around treating people like trash because of what I had been through. So whatever your bad hard time is at job, I don't care. You shouldn't be projecting. You know what I mean? And I had a few of these friends that were just projecting onto me. And there was one day in particular I was on the phone with this one friend and I I was having car trouble. My Jeep went into the shop. It needed like a water pump and a couple other things. And 
um, they had the, the shop, I took it to a new shop that I wasn't familiar with and the mechanics had it for like three weeks and I was really upset because I just wanted my car back. You know, I was like, what's taking so long? I'm like, I'm not getting an engine replaced. They're not dropping the transmission, you know? And so I called this friend one day and I was like, just kind of shooting the shit. Like, oh, you know, I'm so upset. I'm worried about my car. Like, you know, I've called them. They keep putting me off. Like, what would you do? And her response was, well, I don't know, Crystal. It's your car. So what would you do about it? And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, I was just trying to make small talk. I was just trying to have a conversation. Like, I mean, sorry. You know what I mean? Like, and what ended up happening was every time I got off the phone with that person, I was depressed and I was asking myself, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Every time I was on the phone, and remember, I'm trying to eliminate negative belief systems. My finances are finally better than great. I'm back on a normal path. I'm vibrating higher than I ever have. But I talked to this friend on the phone and they immediately dropped me down energy vampire style. And it was every single day. And I was like, for hours, I'd be like, what did I do? Why, why is this person treating me like this? I don't know what I did wrong, you know? And then a few days of being treated like this turned into a few weeks, and then a few weeks turned into a few months. And this is where Robert Greene says, you know, it's one thing if a person, you know, is having a bad day or two. You know what I mean? Like, that's one thing. You can always call them out and say, hey, you, you have, you've been having some attitude lately. Is everything okay? It's another thing when it is a repeated pattern. You cannot ask someone to change because then you're putting on rose-colored glasses and you're ignoring the person that they actually are. And I was hurt. I was hurt because now it's been months of this person treating me terrible. And I got to the point where I, I was trying to call. These are multiple friends. I'm trying to call them. They're not answering my phone calls. And I don't have anything to say. I'm just like, hey, how's your day, you know? I'm texting, they ignore my text for either 8 or 12 hours or sometimes days at a time. And the only time I talk to them now is when they have time to call me. Otherwise, I don't hear, they won't answer my, what if I need to talk, you know what I mean? Like, relationships should be reciprocity, it should be equal give and take. And all of this stemmed from my father's estate paying out and, it, and my mother's estate paying out and it was just shocking to me that money would change people and by the way no one really knows how much i got like i don't that's that's my business i don't discuss it but it was like active jealousy of like oh we don't want crystal to make it out of this we want her to stay in the dark and um i got to the point where i stopped answering the phone calls because i was like you know what i don't want to feel bad anymore i'm vibrating at a really high level everything good is going for me now and i don't want to feel like this and it was interesting because this is going back to the manipulation and the dark psychology. And when I totally reversed and, re and sort of retreated my energy from them. And it was like a week or two where we weren't talking, didn't hear a peep from me, no text message, nothing. Now they're panicking. Now they're blowing up my phone, blowing up text messages, blowing me up on all social media platforms, Snapchat, Instagram you name it, TikTok. And I'm like, why are you messaging me and calling me? Like, you treat me like you hate me. So why are you even, you know what I mean? Like, there doesn't need to be a blowout fight. Just go away. Like, I'm sort of doing you a favor by, like, you don't want me in your energy, clearly. I have never talked to you or yelled at you like that. So let me just do you a favor and disappear. And that tells you that goes back into the manipulation of the dark psychology is like they want their talons and their grip on you. They don't want you to stray from their energy because they're using you as a feeding source essentially of energy. And um, this Robert Greene really changed my life with his book so I can't suggest it more how amazing it was. I gave enough chances you know what I mean? Those last few months to try to let these people sort of like if it was a bad few days or whatever, but it just didn't stop. I did eventually confront them because I know that communication is key. And I said, wow, you know, you haven't been very nice for like a while. It's three people that did this to me in my life. And their response was, oh, I'm sorry you felt that way. 
I didn't know that I was doing that, sorry. And I'm like, how did you not know? My demeanor changed on the phone. There were times I would even cut the conversation short because it hurt my feelings what you were saying. But once again, it just tells you it was a feeding source. It was an energetic feeding source. This is where Robert Greene steps in and says, these are the kind of people that are master manipulators. They see you as an opportunity. The only reason they're keeping you in their life is because they're an opportunist. And yes, stricter boundaries need to be implemented. And if people are gonna say they're doing things and they never do them and they don't follow through and they don't call you, they ignore your texts, they ignore your phone calls, they are proving you are not a priority in their life. There is no reciprocity. There is no equal give and take. There is nothing left, you know what I mean? And it's just, it's crazy to me that I didn't realize that I had people in my life that thought I was gonna be you know, willing to tolerate that kind of behavior. So I knew once I could get past this, the next phase was going to be sort of stepping into my own energy and retreating and hermiting for February and March couldn't have been a better decision because I was able to really bring my vibration up to a point now where um, self-isolating made my aura very strong and I'm really unbreakable. I can't be phased, I can't be hurt now. I know that it's not me that's the problem. And I decided to, you know, now that I was financially free again, that I could start investing in things. And this is kind of what I wanted to talk to you guys about. A lot of people were like, why aren't you filming Paranormal and Ghost Girl Diaries? And it's like, guys, because I needed a new camera. My computer was so old, every time I would try to edit a YouTube video, it would shut down. So I had to invest in a $1,000 computer. I ended up investing about $10,000 into my studio. I got new lighting, I got a new camera, all kinds of new stuff. And um, that was kind of... The step one. Step two was making sure I got my confidence back because when I have been out of paranormal for so long it does feel weird. I even purchased a bunch of new paranormal equipment that I can't wait to share with everybody. I also had to make the decision what I was going to do with family. You know I have these family members coming back in. I had these family members coming back in and I had to make the decision of am I going to let them back in and I had to decide that the door needed to remain shut for my own safety and for my own mental health. And uh, I have these family members online currently on their profiles sharing my content and bragging about who I am. And just let me let you know, anyone that's related to me, I have two uncles that have been very kind. And other than that, if anyone ever claims to be related to me, I am not close with them. I haven't been in years and they are just trying to tailcoat me. That's really just the truth. And I don't think I need to address it other than that. But you know, that's not family either. You're, you haven't addressed the fact that my mother's died. You were still in contact with her. There's been no condolences shared. But now you're going to try to sort of claim my fame. Like, they're leaving these comments on my YouTube channel like, oh, I always knew Crystal was gonna be somebody important. It's just, it's really gross. And um, I had to make sure that I kept my vibration high and away from people like that. Div you know, balancing my masculine and feminine energies was kind of weird. I, I went way, way feminine for a while. I'm sure you guys saw that on social media. I tried to stay off of social media because I knew I was going to end up needing to kind of balance it back out. There's a creator on TikTok named Sammy. She's British. She really knows how to merge sort of goth alt style with like classy. So she almost, she even uses like Louis Vuitton and Chanel bags. And, she does it so seamlessly and beautiful and she was definitely an inspiration for me to be able to balance that masculine feminine side back out. And I needed to get some you know, examples because now I've sort of come back into the 3D, right? And now I'm ready to start my journey back on Ghost Girl Diaries. And I had to start thinking about examples of people that I know or that I've met who have completely merged with their higher selves. And there's two people that came to mind immediately. One is Elvira. Elvira has 100% completely merged with her higher self, and that is Elvira. And I know that sometimes we only see her with red hair and Cassandra. That's her 3D version. Her higher self is Elvira. She does it seamlessly. She puts on the wig and the makeup. She's Elvira. She takes it off. She's not. Chris Motionless does this. So that, to me, is very divine feminine energy. Even though she's goth, it's still divine feminine. And then when you look at Chris Motionless, I am just blown away by him, especially getting to work with him, obviously, with Curse, with the music video, with social media. He, I've never seen, it is so hard for men 
that are divine masculines to step into their higher power without ego because masculine energy men often get such big egos and it's overly inflated that they can't control it chris steps onto stage you guys probably saw him perform with Rhea at wrestlemania he steps on the stage he channels his higher self the second he steps off the stage he just chris sorelli again goes right back to who he was before motionless and white that was admirable and I mean, if you listen to Chris and Motionless and White, their music, he's written most of the songs or co-written the songs. And the lyrics are just such channels to the divine. It's just unbelievable. Same with the, um, if you ever want to witness someone visually, um, you know, merging with their higher self. I mean, obviously Chris and Elvira are examples, but also the drummer from Red Hot Chili Peppers is so crazy. He'll sit down to drum and he's like, oh yeah, talking. And then all of a sudden his higher self steps in and he's like just jamming out. And he's like, I mean, most people that are musically inclined are absolutely like divinely connected to source, but that's a visual to just see it start and then it shuts off. And I was like, I want to be able to do this with Ghost Girl Diaries. I want to be able to channel in Ghost Girl Diaries and then shut it off and channel in my higher self and then shut it off. So that's been something I've been practicing and working on. But, you know, another um, easy visualization of this is Chris's um, music video for Sign of Life. It's Motionless and White Sign of Life. I mean, I don't even know if he realizes when he's like planning this stuff or making these songs. If you watch Sign of Life, it literally is a representation of him incarnating from his higher self. And it's freaking fascinating to me. Everyone has to have sort of divine feminine energy. You know, it has to be balanced. But, you know, Chris is, it's amazing. Like the lyrics, you've got to like listen to his real lyrics. And, and a bad example of too much feminine energy would be like the girls that went through all the Playboy trauma because they really believed they had to be only feminine. Still have to have a balance of that masculine energy, which is why they, I think when you're unbalanced, so if you're too much in your feminine energy without any masculine, that's probably because of daddy issues, some sort of daddy issues. Or then you have the opposite, which is like Hugh Hefner, who had mommy issues, who's too far in his ego and too far in his masculine. That can also be dangerous. This kind of ends the chapter of this. My healing's done. I mean, it's not done. It's never going to be done. We're never, ever 100% healed. But as long as you're actively working on it, I feel like a different person honestly and thank you for going on this healing journey with me for the past few years I've, I've undergone a lot of transformations i know i know i've probably changed a lot to you as the viewer from og days of ghost girl diaries and life growing up trauma changes you right like it's just a normal thing i'm still going to do lifestyle podcasts once in a while but it's time to get back into paranormal it's definitely time and it was only right of me to do a proper ending and this is it the rebirth's already taken place she's already here and um thank you guys for being on this spiritual journey that i didn't know i was going to be taking and it'll be interesting to see what the next phase brings in with me merging now with my higher self with uh having these new abilities that i'm really not sure how to guide them, but I think it'll be interesting in haunted locations. So new content's next for Ghost Girl Diaries. I just talked to Josh the other day. He's the guy that does like, he's done my security for Ghost Girl Diaries for years. And he was like, okay, we're waiting on Ghost Girl Diaries. We're, we're waiting on Ghost Girl Crystal. He's like, is she ready? And I was like, yeah, Josh, she's ready. Thank you.